So hello everyone. I um, want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me to the AI week and for organizing this event and uh, also the chair for the introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about the uh, classic signal processing uh, meeting uh, deep learning. Uh, I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University. I lead a group in deep learning that also look at the theory, applications, and now I will talk about how we can use classic signal processing in deep learning. So we all of us know that deep learning is great. Uh, we have the AI week where almost everyone uses deep learning and we have so seen so many nice applications, but we less understand why it is working. It requires lots of training examples. And also, it is sensitive to the domain of the training data. On the other hand, we know that classic signal processing has very good theory, has very nice analysis, has many deterministic techniques. But with respect to the quality of the results, it comes short of deep learning. So the question is whether classic deep learning, classic signal processing is dead, or it can be still useful in our modern days. So the question that I will pose now is whether we can combine classics or classic signal processing with modern and improve both of them. Uh, yesterday, my PhD student uh, Shadia Hussein gave a talk about how we can use generalized sampling to improve signal image super resolution, which is one example of how we can use classic techniques to improve the use of deep learning. Here I will show other examples from research that is done in my lab in, in collaboration with others that show that classic techniques are not dead, but on the other hand, they can improve a lot our usage of deep learning in many domains. First example I will use is free analysis. So free analysis, is very nice, all of us learned about it. And the first observation that we'll show you is that neural network mappings can be viewed as band-limited functions. So in this figure, we show a projection of a classification plane of two digits into a two-dimensional space. So we take two digits from a, a MNIST and then project using uh, PCA the two digits, you project each image of a digit to a two-dimensional plane, and then each dot here represents one digit from our data set. And then I have a neural network that takes the digits and give me an output, which is either minus one if it's the first digit or one if it's the second digit. And here we can see the separation plane that we got with the neural network. And you can see that if I calculate the Fourier of this separation plane, I get a function that is band limited. So this shows us that we can look at neural network as band limited functions. So we have very rich theory for band limited functions or the sampling theory. So how we can use that? So first usage, so if we assume that the mappings that we get with the neural network is band limited, then we can use generalized sampling theory and answer the question of how the error of a network behave with the number of training examples that we have. And then I've shown that if the number of training examples that we have is N and the dimension of the data is D or the internal dimension of the data is D, then the error go as one over N to the power of D plus two divided by D. If the dimension is uh, two, like we had before, so it's one over two to the power in, uh, of one and a half. If the dimension is uh, very large, then we things go like one over n. Now we can use this also not only to derive theory but also have practical techniques. So, for example, one of the challenges when we train our network is label noise. Label noise means that someone gives you training data. And unfortunately, not all the labels in the data is correct. So assume that you want to distinguish between cats and dogs. For some of the cats, the labelers 
told you that they're a dog, and for some of the dogs, the labelers told you that they're cats. This might be because of uh, the, the labor, uh, the people that made the labels were uh, made a mistake or just because the cat looked like a dog. But in general, label noise, if it is random, it looks like random noise. And we know that noise in general has high frequencies. So if a network gives us a mapping that has low frequencies, a noise is in high frequencies. So if we will use a regularization technique that decay the high frequencies, we will be able to overcome level noise. So in a, a recent work with my student, we have shown that L2 and spectral normalization penalizes high frequencies in the mapping that the network induces. And therefore, if we will use it with the neural network, we will get improved performance when training a network that has level noise. So here we have different noise rates, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.3. Uh, so 0 0.1 is like 10% of the labels has noise, or 30% or 50% of the labels. And we can see that if we use L2 normalization and the spectral normalization, we improve robustness to label noise. So here we can see how free analysis can help us to understand what happens in the network and how we can improve performance. Now let's go to another tool that uh, we can uh, use to improve uh, robustness. So this is joint work with the IBM researcher in Israel uh, and also colleagues from MIT and the uh, Boston University. Uh, so, uh, and, the, and here we go to edges. So all of us know that in classic image processing and computer vision, everyone used edges and used a, a canny edge detectors. And then the question is whether edges or classic techniques that find edges can be still useful. So let's look at the problem of a, a training a network that try to work in several domains. What I mean in several domains, let's assume that we want to try to detect or classify images. But some of the images are real images, some of the images are art images, and other images are sketches. So can we train a network that work on real images to work on sketches at the same time? And the answer for that is that if we use a bridge domain, which here in our case is edges, we can do that in a better way. So in this work, which we call Brad, uh, we have shown that uh, by using edges, we can improve performance and improve generalization of networks. So the goal is uh, to, to try to have some unsupervised pre-training of a domain invariant representation. So we look at several setups. Uh, one setup is that we have a unsupervised domain adaptation. So we have a training data where we have both the source and target domain, but the target domain doesn't have, a, a, both of them don't have labels. And then we have a test domain. Uh, we have also unsupervised domain generalization when, where we train on source domain, we never see the target domain and we still want to get good results on the target domain. And we have unsupervised generalization across multi-domain data sets, which means that we train on source domain and we want to get good results on all the domains together. Now with standard learning, this doesn't work so well, but when we use this broad, this bridge across domains, we have, we train a network that get examples from many data sets, from many domains. And then we calculate the uh, edges of each of the images. And we require a consistency in the representation also using this edge information. And interestingly, edge information is more consistent across domain compared to just looking at the colors themselves, which the network is using. So this uh, edge domain serves as a regularizer and it gives us very large improvement on many tasks. So for example, if we looked at unsupervised training on multiple source domains, and then we test on a novel unseen domain. So this is the problem of unsupervised domain generalization. So we train on multiple source domain, but then we test on an unseen new domain that we never saw before. 
So it's like training on sketches and real images and then testing on art. We never saw art before. And we see very large improvement using our technique. If we look at unsupervised domain adaptation, when we have unsupervised training on both source and target domain, and then we just get a few labels from the source domain and test our a classifier on the target domain, we also get using our technique very large improvement compared to all other techniques. So here you can see that edges that are classic are very useful also to improve neural network training. Last example that I will take uh, is using uh, Gaussian mixture models. So we know that Gaussian mixture models are very nice models for representing data. And, but clearly today, if you want to represent data, so we will use uh, uh, generative models or diffusion models, so we'll use neural networks to represent the data. And the question is whether Gaussian mixture models that have very nice mathematical characteristics are still useful to improve neural network performance. And for that, let's consider a task where we want to have a network that can treat specific parts of a shape. And here we look at the geometric representation. So assume that we have this chair and one, and now we want just to change the legs of this chair, to take the legs from this chair and put it with this chair and get this one. And then we want to take the back of the chair and just the back, take it back. And here, take the legs here and replace them. And here, move the legs. And here, uh, change the handles. The question is how we can have a neural network that is part aware, that can modify just specific parts. So what we want to do, we want to mix a network with some classic presentation. So a very known food where we mix things is spaghetti. So we make a spaghetti. And our spaghetti network has three components. It has a decomposition network that take a latent representation from which we want to generate a shape and convert it to a Gaussian mixture model. Now, in this Gaussian mixture model, in a very in an unsupervised way, each Gaussian represent part of the network. And then we have a mixing network that know to combine all the uh, parts that the Gaussian mixture model give us. And then we have an occupancy network that give us uh, what we call a sign distance function or implicit representation of the shape. And we get the nice shapes that I've shown you before. And here we have another scheme. So we use a transformer for the mixing in the occupancy network. And in the first part, we have an the composition network, which is MLP, that generate the uh, Gaussian mixture models. So here, for example, you can see the representation that we have. So here, for example, we have this chair, and these are the Gaussians that represent this chair. Here we have a lamp, and we have these Gaussians that represent this lamp. And here we have an airplane, and we have these uh, Gaussians that represent this uh, airplane. So this GMM representation allows us to have part level control. And with this part level control, basically we can take a chair and decide to change just its leg. So here you can see interpolation in the latent space that perform interpolation just on part of the shape. You can see that all the, here only the place where we see it changes, all the other parts remain the same. Here at the back of the chair it changes, everything else remain the same. And the reason that we are able to do that is because of the Gaussian mixture model. So we use a classic representation to get better use of a network, something that is interpretable. And now if we have something that is interpretable, so we can do also nice editing. So we can select parts of different chairs and then combine them together. So you can see that we selected the legs from this chair, the back from this chair, and the sitting place from this chair. And then we can edit them and the we can delete parts, we can add parts from the shapes that we want. And the re again, the reason that we did that, we, we can do that, is because we have this GMM integrated in our network and we have interpretable component that we understand what it is doing. And once we understand what it is doing, we are able to add very, uh, uh, we have we are able to add certain regularization in the training that allow us 
to modify and train the shape in an interpretable way. So thank you very much, and we'll be happy to answer any question. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Raja. So uh, I think we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, the first one, uh, you have shown the use of uh, Fourier with the transform with neural nets. What about other transforms such as wavelet transform? Are there any advantages or disadvantages to use them with? Okay, so also uh, the, uh, there are works that show uh, using a classic uh, transformation with neural network. So uh, Guillermo Sapiro that talked yesterday, I've shown that you can take, for example, wavelet filters and represent uh, filters of a network as composition of wavelet filters. Uh, and also for analyzing neural networks, so we have the uh, scattering networks uh, by Joan Bruna that also use wavelets to understand and provide theoretical analysis of neural networks. Okay, and uh, yet another question. Do we need to use model-based approaches only when uh, there is a lack of data or even when we have enough data, model-based approach can be useful? Okay, so uh, clearly when we have a only a small amount of data, model-based approaches allow us to gain much better results. But as I have shown in the talk, also when we have lots of data, model-based approaches have many advantages. For example, we have seen that we get interpretable um, a representation that allow us to do editing and allow us to understand what we are doing. And the other thing, it allows us also to get a better generalization across domains and a better robustness to uh, noise in the data, uh, to uh, diff variations in the data, to long tails that we have in the data and the distribution, et cetera. Okay, great. So uh, one another question. So uh, what in your view will be the most appropriate way of um, basically approach. Okay. How do you use this uh, combination? So, so I, I think that this is a, the, the, a very important uh, question to ask or how to combine both. And I don't think that there is a specific way to do that. I, I think that there, uh, it, it depends on the problem you are trying to solve and there are various approaches to that. So this can be either in the loss function that you use that uh, do some regularization, like in the bridge across domain with the edges. It can be something where you build some of the components in your network uh, to obey some conditions. For example, if you know that you want your network to be invariant to translation, so you can have the convolutions, instead of using just regular convolution, you have can use a variant of them that is equivariant to a uh, rotation. So, so this very much depends on the problem, but uh, you, you can design either the structure of the network or the uh, regularization or the uh, loss function that you use using say, the classic techniques. Okay, 